for everyone just joining us. Uh, feel free to leave uh, a little note in the chat to let us know who you are and why you showed up today and some questions you might have. Thank you, Ellen and, or Ellie, sorry, and uh, Toledo Abel for doing that already. All right, well, it's 2.05, so we'll get this show on the road. My name is Josh Eisenfeld. I'm the marketing director at Fair Shake Environmental Legal Services, and welcome to the Community Democracy webinar series. I see a lot of new names and faces, so excited to have you for what is day four of a week-long series of webinars um, designed to help people get the tools they need to make the changes they want in the communities that they live in. So a few housekeeping tips just to start today off. As I've told some of you already, we are recording and live streaming today's uh, webinar. So if you have any issues with that, please you know, log off now. You can view on Facebook uh, or later we'll be put it, putting it on YouTube for everyone to see. Um, and also while you're here, please try to stay muted just to avoid interruptions. Um, I don't think there's anyone on the phone, so I don't need to give that little tidbit. But uh, also, if you're having trouble with your playback, you can turn off your video. That's one way to increase your bandwidth, uh, avoid lagginess. But if you see any lagginess or hear any, have any issues, please let us know in the chat and we will work through any of those problems. I know Zoom is very overloaded this week with uh, everyone going back to school. But we haven't had any problems yet, knocking on wood. If you have any questions along the way, uh, Drop those lines in, in the chat. You can send them directly to me. My name is Josh Eisenfeld. Uh, in, in the actual chat bubble, you can select me and send it privately, or you can send it to the whole group. And I will uh, gladly make sure we get to that on, at the very end of Andy's presentation. Um, or at the end of the presentation, you can also, uh, you uh, will be able to raise your hand and we'll, we'll click on, or. Uh, a lot of people to talk at the end when we have a q and a so um we do want this to be conversational we want everyone to feel like they get a chance to not just like type in a question and i read it but you'll actually get a chance to talk and, and ask a question to andy uh also um I, there actually won't be any links so you can ignore that that last little bit but um just want to give you we are Fair Shake Environmental Legal Services. We're a nonprofit law firm that uh, creates access to justice for people and their environment. We do that by providing legal services on an income basis throughout the Appalachian Basin of Ohio and Pennsylvania and soon West Virginia, as well as beyond. Um, and we, we do all of that, but we also go beyond the courtroom. And, and that's part of what we're here for today, to provide support and tools for community leaders to make the changes that they want to see. Today's presentation will be brought to you by the one and only Andy Karras. Andy is one of our staff attorneys here uh, in Ohio, um, and he also practices in Pennsylvania. He's a passionate advocate for environmental and social justice, and he's a proud member of the Democratic Socialists of America. He's also affiliated with their legal working group, as well as an active member of the National Lawyers Guild. So, before I pass it off to Andy, just want to give you a few ways to get in touch with us. Uh, if you need to reach out to us, maybe you uh, had some difficulties with hearing things today, or you just want to stay in touch. Um, there are two links right here that are the best ways to reach out. Um, our newsletter is always packed with great tidbits about the work we do and the work we see around us. Um, and always, we can't do this work without support from people like you. So if you have the ability to uh, please visit our donation page and consider a contribution today. Thanks for, so much for listening to my little spiel. Uh, I'm going to pass it off now to the main event, to Andy. Um, so Andy, if you're ready, take it away from here. Sure, thank you, Josh. Um, if you can just give me a moment to...
get that positioned and we're rolling. Okay. Um, so, uh, like Josh said, um, I am Andy Karras, and today we are going to be talking about uh, lead paint as an environmental justice issue, um, and uh, thinking a little through uh, what the lead crisis is, what the scope is, what the sources of the problem are, and uh, what we can and should be doing about it. Uh, so, before that, uh, as a lawyer, I, I do have to start with a disclaimer. Um, so this presentation, I am giving it for general informational purposes. Uh, I am a lawyer, but I am not uh, currently your lawyer. Um, so anything I say shouldn't be uh, construed to give legal advice or signify that we are in a lawyer-client relationship with each other. Um, if you do have questions about a particular situation, um, uh, especially if this is an issue that touches you in some way, um, uh, you should consult an attorney. I am happy to be that attorney, um, uh, but uh, we should do that offline. Okay, so let's get to it. Um, what is the problem we're talking about? Um, so let's, let's start by imagining the following scenario. Let's say you are a working class family. You are looking for housing in a new town, a new city. Um, so you sign a lease agreement for an affordable apartment that's close to your work. Uh, when you sign the lease, uh, the lease paperwork includes some forms that talk about uh, lead paint, uh, the dangers of lead. Um, maybe there are some forms that uh, specifically discuss whether your landlord knows of any lead hazards on the property. Uh, maybe your landlord fills those forms out. Maybe he doesn't. Um, I, in any event, you need a place to live. The house seems great. Um, uh, you've seen these forms before. Um, you've signed off on them before. So you don't give this a lot of thought and, and you sign up and you move in. Uh, so a few months later, you notice that your children uh, start acting out. Uh, maybe they become less responsive to your conversation with them. Maybe they engage in play less frequently. Um, uh, if they're in school, if they're of school age, maybe they start doing poorly in school. Uh, so you wonder for a little while what's going on, and after uh, an annual doctor's appointment, uh, you have a checkup and you learn that your child has elevated levels of lead in their blood. So this is unfortunately all too common um, in, in, across the country um, today. Um, so what is lead? Um, lead is a heavy metal um, that acts as a neurotoxin. It causes all sorts of uh, health problems in, in everyone. Um, so lead is linked with cardiovascular problems, uh, problems with reproductive, nervous, digestive, uh, kidney and renal health. Um, if you're suffering from exposure to lead, you might have abdominal pain, uh, you might get constipation, uh, you might become more irritable than you otherwise would be. Uh, you may have difficulty concentrating. Uh, so if you're exposed for a long time, that is, if you have chronic exposure, even at low levels, that can give you uh, hypertension. Uh, that can result in kidney failure. Um, you can lose uh, cognitive capacity and, and neurofunction as you get, as you get older. Um, and at higher levels, um, acute lead poisoning uh, results in more dramatic symptoms like convulsion, coma, death. Um, and so uh, I think something uh, that, that is fairly popularly understood at this point is that all of the health effects we talk about are especially pronounced in children. Um, so uh, in particular, the developmental health effects are pronounced in children. Um, and so when we talk about uh, uh, target housing and target populations uh, of lead regulation, we are typically talking about children under the age of six um, because that's where the health effects are most pronounced. And uh, target housing, uh, what we mean by that is typically homes built before 1978. Um, and the reason for that, and we'll get into this a little more uh, in a bit, is that um, Prior to 1978, most residential paint uh, used on homes uh, contained uh, lead. 
Um, and following 1978, the use of those paints uh, were banned. Um, uh, before I, I move on, it's worth mentioning that lead poisoning does not exclusively come from lead-based paint. Uh, so depending on the age and state of repair of your home, um, a residence may also have lead hazards in uh, old plumbing, um, whether in the pipes or the solder that holds those pipes together. Um, homes built on or near former industrial sites uh, can have lead contamination in their soil. Um, this is especially a problem if uh, uh, certain public housing development uh, that's built near uh, old brownfields. Um, and then also uh, a lot of different cities um, have uh, that feature dated and poorly managed uh, public water supply systems have had problems with lead contaminated water. So today I'm mostly talking about lead-based paints because that's the primary source of lead hazards for most people in most parts of the country, but it's not the entire problem. Um, the other thing I wanna say is that the extent of the problem really can't be overstated. Um, so, so just to illustrate that point, um, Flint, Michigan captured a lot of national headlines uh, for the bureaucratic failures and the failures of Flint's public leadership that led to widespread contamination in its, in its public water supply. Um, and Flint is remarkable in some respects, just for the level of, of government uh, malfeasance and negligence that happened. Um, but in terms of the number of children affected, um, and, and I, I say this with all sensitivity, Flint is actually a little bit unremarkable. Um, so, uh, for instance, this, this stat is uh, a couple of years old at this point, but Cleveland, uh, where I live, um, and the Northeast Ohio region in general, uh, features about three times the rate of children with actionable levels of lead in their blood um, as compared to Flint. Um, so the problem is uh, widespread and the problem is uh, uh, serious and everywhere. Um, so before I go on, I want to take a step back and talk about uh, the concept of environmental justice. Um, so I, I'm gonna start with, an, with a definition of environmental justice that I think is a useful jumping off point. It's a source that's you know, authoritative enough. Um, I'm not saying the US EPA's definition is the most correct or comprehensive definition, but, but like I said, I think it's a good jumping off point. Um, so the US EPA uh, defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Okay, so what, what's kind of encapsulated in, in this idea? What is this definition driving at? So I, I think what the US EPA is driving at and what people who talk about environmental justice are, are driving at is the idea that environmental problems tend to uh, impact most severely uh, those communities that already bear uh, systemic or social disadvantages. Um, so the communities that bear the brunt of environmental problems tend to be poor. Um, oftentimes they are uh, racial communities or uh, communities uh, that disproportionately uh, include racial minorities. Um, oftentimes they disproportionately include members of the disability community um, and, and otherwise marginal persons. Um, so, uh, just sort of stated differently, uh, are the problems that exist in, in society are, are intersectional. And so our solutions to these problems have to consider and take into account uh, where those intersections lie and uh, address themselves, themselves accordingly. Okay, back to lead paint. Let's, let's think about uh, environmental justice as as a prism for thinking about the lead paint problem. Um, so, so I wanna start just by illustrating this problem graphically. Uh, so on, on, the, on your screen, you should see two maps. Um, on the left is a map uh, showing the concentration of people in particular neighborhoods. Uh, this is the city of Chicago, uh, where residents uh, participate in the HCV or Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, so HCV, it's, it's commonly called Section 8. It's a subsidy program uh, 
essentially that allows low income families to shop in the private rental market for, for housing. Uh, so that's the map on the left. The map on the right, um, which you may notice uh, is nearly overlapping in its, uh, in its color scheme, uh, shows those neighborhoods in Chicago which feature the greatest numbers of children with elevated uh, lead blood levels. Uh, so, so let's think through these maps and, and what they tell us. So we understand uh, that lead paint affects old, unrehabilitated houses. Um, and so we understand that those people affected by it, the people living in those houses, are generally those people that lack the funds or other resources to make their homes lead safe. Um, so just given the society we live in, this functionally means that the families affected by the lead crisis overwhelmingly tend to be poor, um, which in turn means uh, they are uh, disproportionately renters rather than homeowner occupants. Uh, people affected by the lead crisis are disproportionately um, black or brown or other communities of color. Um, and uh, they disproportionately affect members of the disability community as well. Um, I, I also want to mention that uh, the problem with respect to lead is especially cyclical given you know, the nature of lead and what it is. Like, like we talk about lead as a neurotoxin, um, which is to say that it may, makes your brain not work as well. Um, and so the educational and professional disadvantages that go along with um, uh, being an economically disadvantaged, being a racial minority, um, being subject to other forms of segregation or discrimination, uh, get exacerbated um, when you suffer from lead poisoning. Um, and uh, just to kind of put a final point on this, um, so I pulled these maps from an article that actually contains um, a third map that you can overlay um, nearly just as well. Um, and that's a map of which Chicago neighborhoods are historically redlined communities. Um, uh, and finally, uh, this is uh, something that I think is worth talking about in the current moment. Um, but I would be remiss to, uh, if I didn't at least mention uh, the pandemic that we're uh, all living through as having a compounding effect on all of the problems that, that we're talking about. Um, so uh, about 30 people, or about 30% of people in America weren't able to make their rent or housing payment um, in June. Um, and as uh, there's been uh, an in increasing unwillingness to act um, on the part of, of Congress um, in terms of renewing uh, direct stimulus payments, uh, that problem is going to get worse in subsequent months. So. Uh, the lead crisis, in, in some senses, springs from the power imbalance that exists between landlords and their tenants. And so uh, you can imagine what happens to, to that power imbalance when you layer on top of it you know, an inability to pay rent because of COVID. Okay, um, so let's talk about uh, how lead is regulated in the United States. So. Um, people uh, have understood in some respect or another that lead is poisonous. Um, for about 2,000 odd years, um, there are, are Greek philosophers who talk about the effects of lead poisoning. Um, uh, to speak specifically about the history of lead paint regulation in the United States, um, consistently and throughout the early uh, 20th century, so throughout the 1900s, um, regulatory efforts uh, uh, were consistently defeated by industry, despite uh, pretty widespread knowledge that uh, lead, at least at acute levels, was, was, was poisonous for people. And so it wasn't until 1970 um, that Congress passed uh, the Lead-Based Paint Poisoning and Prevention Act. Um, what that act did was essentially establish a consumer product safety commission that had power to uh, ban uh, lead components in uh, certain consumer products. So in 1978, uh, the US Consumer Product and Safety Commission, uh, like we talked about, banned the use of lead paint 
paint in residential uh, paints. So it didn't ban lead paint uh, in everything. Uh, there were still commercial applications that were perfectly acceptable. Um, and it didn't ban uh, the use of lead entirely in other products. But um, the worst source of the problem um, then as now um, was flaking residential paint and lead dust from uh, old and dilapidated paint in homes. Um, so the ban happened in 1978. Uh, not quite two decades later, it was uh, pretty apparent that the problem was still around and that simply banning uh, the continued use of lead paint wasn't enough to, to solve the problem. So uh, in an effort to uh, see the problem addressed hopefully a little more proactively, uh, Congress passed a law called Title 10. And Title 10 uh, sort of establishes the general framework for the regulation of lead paint today. Um, so basically, Title 10 requires the EPA in conjunction with the Department of Her uh, Urban Housing and Urban Affairs, or HUD, um, to uh, promulgate rules that address uh, when landlords and sellers of real property need to disclose uh, lead hazards that exist. Um, so in 1996, uh, HUD and EPA did jointly promulgate the lead disclosure rule and the lead abatement rule. Um, and uh, essentially, um, uh, that requires when uh, you either rent or purchase a new property that the seller or landlord give you certain inf general information about lead and its dangers, um, as well as specific information about um, uh, where there may be lead contamination in your particular property. Um, so pictured on your screen is a cover page of the most recent form of the publication your landlord or uh, seller has to give you. Um, uh, you may recognize it. It's uh, kind of part and parcel of, of every real estate transaction, at least this form. Um, uh, so, so that's where that is taken from. The other way in which we uh, attempt to address and regulate uh, the existence of lead hazards in homes today are through uh, partnerships between municipal governments uh, and other kinds of local government as well as HUD. So HUD makes grant funding available uh, to different municipalities who then run programs to distribute those funds to uh, owners and renters of affected properties. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about those in just a second. So that's, that's at the federal level anyway, your basic uh, uh, legal landscape uh, for, for regulating lead. Um, so the HUD programs we talk about aren't perfect. Um, so just to illustrate this point, um, I, I've given another side-by-side uh, -side map example. So on the left, this is taken from um, uh, a study prepared uh, by Kent State University um, in conjunction with Akron Children's Hospital. And it shows kind of where the hotspots of, of lead contamination are in the Akron, Ohio area. Um, the map on the right shows which houses have been uh, remediated uh, under Akron's municipal HUD partnership um, uh, for lead hazards. Um, so at, at first blush, this looks like you know, good positive news. You can sort of see that the map on the left loosely tracks to the map on the right. Um, one of the shortfalls, one of the gaps of these programs, though, um, you can sort of see in the way um, I color coded the map on the right. So uh, the map on the right shows uh, remediated properties that are uh, homeowner occupant uh, properties in red or pink. Um, and then the rental properties uh, that have been remediated are in green. Uh, so, so the thing you need to kind of bear in mind about these communities in Akron specifically, um, uh, so all of these neighborhoods are somewhere between 50 and 80% rental communities, um, and, and some of them closer to 80 than 50. 
So just kind of looking at the map, you can see that the problem is only partially being addressed by uh, these grant funding problems uh, or from these uh, grant programs. Um, so uh, part of the problem is that the way these programs are designed uh, sometimes just functionally discourage landlord participation. So a lot of the times they will distinguish between uh, which properties are uh, homeowner occupant occupied and which ones are rental properties. Um, and while they will make unrestricted grant funding available for um, uh, homeowner occupant properties, uh, they'll require matching funds from the landlord before remediation starts. And a lot of the times uh, landlords are reticent to participate for that reason. Um, a lot of the times the marketability of properties once they're remediated uh, become restricted. So sometimes landlords are told that uh, uh, they uh, can only uh, market properties to target communities uh, once they receive funding. Um, and so they're loath to uh, apply for grant funding for that reason. Um, and even when there aren't those sort of uh, procedural systemic barriers to uh, these, these uh, grant funding programs, uh, landlord apathy is a real problem. Um, and so all of these HUD programs, uh, while they're useful for the properties that are remediated, they, they ultimately tend to layer themselves onto without really challenging in any way, um, existing patterns of uh, gentrification. Um, and they can actually uh, exacerbate some of those problems. Um, and I would just, just highlight a lot of the overwhelmingly pink areas on this map in Akron are in a lot of rapidly gentrifying communities like uh, the Highland Square neighborhood. Um, okay. Um, so uh, the other thing um, I, I should mention, um, uh, perhaps uh, strange advice coming from an attorney who does some litigation work around this issue, um, is the courts uh, are, are really ill-equipped uh, to solve this problem uh, on their own. So Title 10, the law we talked about before, does have a provision that lets you sue your landlord uh, when they fail to disclose known lead hazards. Um, uh, but for better or worse, Title 10 has been on the books for uh, two odd decades, and we haven't been able to sue our way out of the problem. Um, so just as a general matter, uh, courts are the system, right? Um, so courts look at and resolve claims according to existing laws and existing doctrine. Uh, and this, is, this applies you know, to lead and it applies to the law writ large. So the laws that exist now uh, always tend to reflect and uphold uh, existing power relations more uh, often than they will actually challenge those power relations. Um, so with Title 10 specifically, with lead disclosure laws specifically, uh, the laws are landlord friendly in a few key ways, and uh, I'll, I'll talk more specifically about that in just, just a second. The other problem with court um, and uh, lawsuits um, is that they're reactive rather than proactive. Um, so if you've been affected by lead, um, courts or court processes uh, may, I should be clear, may be available to help you um, in some way uh, try to become whole. Um, uh, the problem is that they don't stop the problem from happening in the first place. You know, what court gets you are, you know, maybe money damages. Um, so they don't stop you from becoming lead poisoned. Um, and they don't help your neighbor from uh, becoming poisoned down the road. Um, there is a, a lot of more learned and, and smart people have, have sort of thought through the idea of tort law as a tool for social reform than me, but, but I will say that I'm a skeptic. Um, and uh, the evidence, like I said, is that Title 10 has not allowed us to sue our way out of the problem. Um, finally, another problem is that Title 10 and lead paint laws in general tend to look more like uh, civil rights statutes instead of environmental statutes. Uh, so what I mean by that is your classic environmental statute. So take, for instance, the Clean Water Act. Uh, those start from the premise that the polluter pays. 
Um, so if uh, your facility that discharges some sort of illegal pollution into a stream, if you're exceeding your permitted emission standard or something like that, you are responsible, you're liable for that, regardless of what your subjective intent or state of mind was um, when that occurred. Um, so by contrast, in a typical civil rights case, you know, maybe you're uh, suing a police officer for exceeding, for, for violating your civil rights. Uh, you ultimately spend a lot of your time trying to demonstrate and trying to prove uh, the defendant's bad intent or, you know, the, what's going on inside their head, that they had some sort of bad motives. Um, and unfortunately, Title 10 looks more like that than it does, you know, your classic environmental law. So you don't, it's not enough for you to demonstrate um, in a lead paint suit that your house is polluted with lead and that the lead caused you harm. Um, you also have to demonstrate that uh, the landlord or seller uh, knew about the lead and didn't do anything about it. Um, so uh, not only are you in uh, the, the disadvantaged position of needing to prove what's going on in your landlord's head, uh, the laws actually provide an incentive for landlords not to learn uh, about where lead may be on their properties. If they don't inspect and if they don't you know, force themselves to know about it, they don't have a duty to disclose under Title 10. Um, okay, so uh, what should we be doing instead of all these things? Um, so uh, I would propose that we start by recognizing that the lead crisis, like so many of you know, our problems throughout society, so many of our problems of uh, environmental justice as well as racial and economic, uh, gender justice, you know, et cetera, are problems of at their core, problems of power relations. So real estate interests and landlords have more power than most average community residents and workers. Uh, uh, your landlord probably has a better personal and professional relationship with your city councilor than you do, for instance. Um, and your municipal housing policy and your municipal housing policy laws probably reflect that. Um, like we've been talking about on a federal level, that's, that's certainly the case that the laws reflect that power relationship. Um, so what we need instead are laws that center the needs of ordinary people in a preventive uh, as opposed to reactive way. Um, uh, so a lot of the time what uh, people who uh, talk about uh, good lead safe laws uh, speak about uh, is, is, is a word, is a term called primary prevention. So good primary prevention laws are required, are, are laws that require a house to be certified lead safe prior to tenant move-in. Um, and they don't turn on the subjective intent of, of landlords or, or in some cases sellers. Um, so a really good example, a, a good model um, ordinance uh, in this vein is uh, a 2012 amendment that the Philadelphia uh, City Council passed. Um, so in 2012, the Philadelphia City Code um, was amended to uh, require that owners of property built before 1978 and rented to uh, families uh, containing children uh, six years or younger uh, to provide the tenant with certification prepared by um, a certified dust pump technician that the property is uh, either lead free um, or lead safe. Um, and they're actually ramping up that requirement um, in October of this year. Um, so it's not just uh, target housing that is uh, housing with children um, under the age of six, but all housing regardless of the age of, of any children who may live there. Um, other things we should be advocating for. Um, uh, laws that uh, take into account, uh, you know, problems of, like I said, the power imbalance between uh, tenants and their landlords that provide for lease termination and contract avoidance, um, and that provide for relocation assistance. Um, a lot of the time, tenants are in uh, not the best position to advocate for remediation uh, because they don't have anywhere else to go. 
Um, and so thinking through that problem is, is also um, something we, we kind of need to do before we can solve the problem. Uh, we can also uh, advocate for expanded enforcement and oversight and reporting requirements. Um, a lot of uh, cities have great you know, mandates on their books, um, but they're not really backed by uh, sufficiently staffed or sufficiently funded uh, health departments that, that inspect for this problem. Uh, uh, another, uh, just to give an example, an example of a town that has developed pretty good uh, ordinances and laws around uh, the idea of expanded enforcement is, uh, is Burlington, Vermont. Um, uh, another approach we can be thinking about um, uh, is to uh, revisit the project of uh, robust public housing infrastructure. Um, so we've kind of given up in this country on the idea that uh, the government should be providing housing uh, for those people who are unable to afford it. Um, but uh, robust public housing provides a means of uh, more direct accountability um, when problems occur. Um, and it provides uh, a, a simpler mechanism for uh, building new lead safe housing or remediating uh, existing housing to, um, to a state that's lead safe. Um, so those are all uh, just in broad terms policy goals we, we can be shooting for. Um, so how do we get there? Um, and th this is to sort of tie back into everything else um, all of my colleagues here at Fairshake have been talking about all week. Um, so, so we talked a lot about, uh, uh, you know, uh, John on Monday um, and uh, Tim on, on Tuesday really talked a, a lot about uh, community democracy as a theory. Um, and uh, I'm talking a little bit more about um, the idea of community de democracy as an applied problem. So the problems, you know, writ large in society, I think, at their heart are that our institutions are designed to serve the interests of uh, those segments of society that have power and resources. Um, so the solution to those problems is to organize uh, and mobilize uh, politically and otherwise on kind of an inside outside basis. So solving the lead crisis requires uh, organizing to change the power dynamics that we were talking about before. Um, a caveat I should give before I, I talk specifically about any of the you know, kind of methods that you see on your screen is, is at the end of the day, I'm a lawyer. Um, I am not um, an incredibly experienced or deeply experienced community organizer. Um, uh, but a secret that a lot of lawyers uh, don't necessarily share with people is that real power, um, lasting power to make change comes from people recognizing their common goals and organizing for them. Um, lawyers aren't magic. Um, all of the specialized you know, knowledge that we hold you know, in the world um, is less powerful ultimately than, than people power. And I think um, the best movement lawyers um, out there would, would agree with me on that. So advocating for a lot of the initiatives that we were talking about, um, it can involve uh, pressuring uh, your local legislators, um, you know, getting good local lead safe laws um, a lot of the time um, uh, involves uh, just letting your existing city councilors know who you are and what your problems are. Um, because traditionally they, they are not uh, they don't know and they aren't responsive to the problems of people affected by issues like this. Um, maybe an even better uh, approach is to elect uh, existing movement politics leaders to those uh, formal positions of leadership. So your existing city councilor, uh, maybe he got there with the help of the real estate lobby. Um, and so you should replace those people with, with people who are beholden to uh, the communities affected by these problems um, instead of, uh, like I said, th those kinds of capital interests. Um, 
other effective strategies um, in, in places that have had uh, uh, successful organizing efforts are to engage in a little bit of di direct democracy um, or ballot initiatives. Um, so a really good example of this, um, a photo on, on your screen, um, and I, I should just give a caveat, I, I have no you know, deep personal connection to uh, this organization, but the Clash, or Cleveland-led Advocates for Safe Housing, um, in the past year or so, uh, mounted a pressure campaign that uh, got a pretty solid uh, preventative-led law on the books here in Cleveland that will uh, go into effect starting uh, in March of next calendar year um, on, on kind of a staggered basis. Um, and that started with a ballot petition. Um, uh, so kind of approach one listed on your screen, just pressuring legislators. Um, a lot of community members uh, here in Cleveland worked uh, kind of on that inside game basis for a long time and, and uh, were frustrated for a long time with that. Um, and so they uh, changed up their approach um, a little bit and uh, just organized uh, people, organized ordinary people in as, as wide ranging um, a way as possible. Um, and the success of that uh, ballot initiative effort eventually made the legislatures, uh, made city council cave um, and, and passed the law that exists now. Um, and then finally, something we can think about, um, and certainly something that I, I think Clash and other movements like it have thought about, um, are organizing at the tenant level um, and other community organizing efforts. So um, thinking about this as a problem of power relations, again, um, building uh, you know, kind of social infrastructure for things like uh, uh, mass rent strikes um, and, and tactics like that um, can be really effective in solving both particular and uh, sort of more wide scale problems. Um, so those are things we can do. Um, uh, and I am glad that I ended on a bit of a more hopeful note. Um, and that is what I have. Um, uh, in order to hopefully start a conversation and start everybody's thinking about it. Um, my contact information, if you want to get in touch afterward, um, is there on your screen. Um, I'm happy to chat offline um, about, like I said, any particular problems um, or about uh, if you just want to wrap in general about some of this stuff. Um, it's, it's an issue that I think is close to a lot of us and close to a lot of um, environmental justice communities uh, throughout the country. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to field any questions from people um, in the chat um, and uh, have a bit of a conversation. I've been talking at you for a while, so let's, uh, let's see if I can't talk with you. If any, anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and, and fire away. So why don't we, uh, just, to, just to fill the dead air a little bit, um, why don't uh, we just get a sense of, of who's online right now, who's, who there is to chat with. Um, yeah, I think uh, Holly, Holly, I should just turn, were you about to ask a question? Or you just? I've got something I was, I was gonna throw out there. Um, so it, like in Toledo, we don't have a, a super strong organizing culture. Like we don't have a lot of community organizers. We don't have a lot of infrastructure. Um, and we have a, a local coalition, but it's kind of dominated by professionals, agency representatives. And one of the things we're doing is trying to bring more voices from neighborhoods into that space and make sure that, that people get heard. And I, if you've got any suggestions, thoughts for how to do that, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, um, this is, yeah. So uh, I, part of the problem is, uh, I, I think uh, 
something I said before, again, is that I'm, I myself am a lawyer and not a community organizer. And um, a lot of the times it's really difficult to enter these conversations without, you know, uh, coming from a place of, you know, suggesting that you're, you know, some sort of a, a savior. Um, uh, uh, on the other hand, I think uh, two sort of thoughts. Um, the more you always do the work and the more you keep showing up, even if you are not necessarily of these communities, um, uh, the more you start to gain traction and credibility with them. And, you know, unfortunately there are no shortcuts to that, but I think it's true, um, at least, you know, based on, on my limited experience. Um, you, you start to build the movement uh, just by doing the work. Um, and, uh, and hopefully over time, you know, the fact that maybe your core group feels over-professionalized sort of works itself out so long as you're conscious and deliberate about thinking through that as a problem. Um, uh, and I did say I had a second thought on that and I forget what it is now that I've started talking. Um, Salida is a really interesting case though. Um, uh, just sort of given uh, kind of the, the the circuitous history that like local legislation has had there, um, like there was, and, and maybe it's a result of some of the problems we're talking about, right? Just the way the initial uh, ordinance there was structured to you know discriminate between big and little landlords and and the problems that caused for actually enforcing it. Um, Um, so it looks like there is another question um, from the chat, and that is, is there any way, uh, is there anyone tracking lead in the Cleveland area in a way that would let us know if our water system has a problem uh, like Flint, Michigan? Um, so uh, certainly lead is something that the Division of Cleveland uh, Water tests for. Um, uh, what I will say is that, so it's, it's not the case, that, so problems with lead water in Cleveland um, uh, historically have tended to be localized to residences. Um, so we, we, we generally haven't had a problem with, with municipal water supply, which isn't to say we couldn't or never will, um, or haven't, you know, to, to any degree. Um, uh, but a good resource might just be, you know, the Cleveland Division of, of Water. You know, the people that send you water bills um, have a pretty good, uh, I think, um, just website portals um, that speak to that sort of thing. Holly, do you have any other like follow-ups to that? With your question. To my original question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, it was interesting. I was actually in a meeting this morning with where I got some more insight into the newest version of our ordinance. Um, and, you know, and I can say like, so I'm here, like I work for ABLE, which is uh, the legal aid organization that was involved in the creation of that early version of the ordinance. And there was a lot of disagreement. Um, and I, at the time I wasn't involved, so I don't know like how how that decision was reached, but um, I think we've got a better version now. And I, I think they tried to do a better job of, of uh, not necessarily balancing landlord interests, I guess maybe that's what it is, but also just creating some resources for landlords so that they had the ability to comply. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. But, um, but yeah, I, um, I, you know, I've been kind of on the fringes of Toledo's lead work just for the last three years, and now I'm going to be a little bit more involved in it. And this was extremely helpful, so I appreciate it. We're really glad to hear that. 
I actually have a, a little follow-up to uh, the question on tracking lead in the water system, which is, has anybody done anything on soil? Um, like areas where, you know, neighborhoods that are adjacent to highways um, and, you know, leaded gasoline from back in the day, I imagine is still hanging around in certain neighborhoods in the soil. Yeah, I mean, there are certainly organizations that have done research into, um, uh, you know, lead contamination in soil. And, uh, you know, I, I have, you know, kind of, unfortunately, maybe too vague an understanding about um, where those problems are. Um, a, a lot of soil contamination that I've, that I've heard about tends to be, you know, public or otherwise uh, disproportionately, you know, communities of, of, of poverty um, housing near formal industrial sites. Um, uh, but gasoline um, is an interesting issue to think through as well. Um, I, 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 I wish I, you know, knew more to answer that question. Yeah, and, and just to follow up, Emily put this in the chat, but um, it's some, some of the work that we've been fortunate to be able to do even this, this summer is to check for heavy metals in a specific area around the Pittsburgh region. And, um, but you know, to answer your question, there are not many groups doing this kind of work. Uh, you have to get funding to do it. It's not being done by, let's say like your, your government most likely, um, but there are ways to do it. And I think that's, the organizing part of it that, that Andy keeps referring to, uh, the getting ahead of the curve part of it that, that we're referring to. Um, these questions you're asking, you're not the only one asking them. And so it's about finding who else is asking those questions, banding together, asking the people with the funding who want to pursue these questions too, because I'm sure there are people in high places that want to know those answers as well. Uh, so it's just like connecting all those dots is, is really the, the part of getting ahead of the curve. And it sounds like that's what you're doing already, Holly, which is, which is great. Um, but yeah, it, it, it can be done. It just needs to be pursued. Does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, I hate to cut it off here. Well, um, I, I guess, so I did sort of remember the second thing I, I wanted to say to Holly's question originally, and maybe I can sort of tie this up to a, to a good point to end on too. A lot of the time when we are sort of perseverating on whether our movements are sufficiently representative, so I, I'm thinking about um, outside of the lead paint context, it's really normal for me to sit in uh, like community organizing uh, where um, and then announces, you know, this room is a little too white for for, for me. Um, and it's a, one thing I'll say, <laughs> and, uh, and so it, it feels a little, you know, self-congratulatory and unhelpful. Um, which is not to say that that's, that's what you were saying, because I think there's a genuine version of that fear um, that I, I think you and I both think about. But the other thing to think about is that usually when people sort of say that sort of thing, there are, you know, maybe not enough, but there are some people from those communities that are part of the discussion. And it's maybe just important to uh, center their voices in a way that uh, they're not being centered um, and to not erase the fact that they are there. Um, uh, and with that, I think uh, that's, that's... And thank you for that note in, in Jermaine, it, from Jermaine. Um, yeah. I mean, just to answer your question, am I talking about lead in specific places? Um, not so much. I mean, I gave a couple of specific examples. Um, 
And what I will say is if you're interested in watching the rest, um, if you're interested in me talking at you for a while, I, I think Josh indicated that this will be available uh, online, both on Facebook and YouTube for posterity's sake. And, uh, uh, and I would also say to you, Jermaine, uh, uh, um, Keep, the, keep up the good work you're doing um, and get the lead out of Pittsburgh. It's a, it's a great organization that's doing a lot of the work that uh, we've been talking about. And I, I have perhaps been a little bit Ohio specific just because that's uh, mostly where my uh, kind of personal experiences are coming from. But um, this is a problem everywhere in America. You know, where have we been building houses since before 1978? That's, that's virtually everywhere. Um, where are, you know, uh, where are communities of people in poverty um, throughout the United States? That's everywhere. So the lead crisis is, is everywhere, you know, um, throughout the Rust Belt and, and kind of beyond. All right, if there are no more questions, I guess we can, uh, we can call it a day. And, and if you think of anything else along the way, Andy sent, uh, has contact info there. I will send a follow-up email at the end of this week once all of the uh, webinars are complete. And uh, we'll give you ways to reach out to us again. This is not the last chance for you to ask questions. We're always here for you. Um, and hopefully we can work together to start getting ahead of the curve on some of these issues and help in our own way with the organizing efforts. Um, so thanks so much for showing up. And uh, yeah, thanks for all you guys are doing. Looking forward to seeing you all down the road. Thanks everybody.